Let's, let's, let's clear it up because I really want this to be correct. Yeah, you said. We are going to interrupt this program for a special bulletin. We will pause for a moment first to let our other stations around the nation join us. I'm Peter Jennings at ABC News headquarters. We have uh, heard just a couple of minutes ago that President Nixon um, may have died, and we emphasize that is a rumor at this point. We say so because President Clinton has decided he's going to come to the White House uh, cameras in a very short period from now and make some statement, and virtually all of our sources say that it has to do with President Nixon. But as soon as we're able to confirm that for you, we will be right back. This has been a special report from ABC News. We return now to 2020 in progress. Minister Farrakhan is very convincing in expressing his beliefs, but we checked on his claims about AIDS and crack, and I'd like to tell you what we found. Expert researchers and sociologists not associated with the government say that crack was already deeply entrenched in major U.S. cities prior to Minister Farrakhan's 1985 speech and that the principal agent of its distribution was not the U.S. government, but illegal. This is a special report from ABC News. Now reporting from New York, Peter Jennings. We're now absolutely able to confirm that President Nixon has died here in New York City. He died at 9.08 p.m., 37th President of the United States, one of the most controversial political figures. In the post-war period, he was 81 years old. We have believed for many hours death was imminent. Let's go to New York Hospital, where Bob Jamison is standing by. Peter, officials here at New York Hospital, where the president has been in the intensive care unit since uh, Tuesday, confirm that he died at 9.08 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, which is about an hour and 20 minutes ago. The officials issued a very simple one-paragraph statement, which said that he died as a result of the massive, massive stroke which he suffered on Monday at his home in New Jersey. And you will remember that he was brought to the hospital here from that home in New Jersey, and for a while on Tuesday it was felt he was getting better. But then he was returned to the intensive care unit after his condition apparently stabilized because of massive swelling in his brain, which was a complication of the stroke, an ominous sign that is considered uh, one of the most feared complications of a stroke. Uh, he fell into a deep coma yesterday, and by most accounts, his condition deteriorated steadily, and death has been had been considered imminent all day long. The only thing we can add at this point is that his family, at least his daughters, Tricia Nixon Cox and Julie Nixon Eisenhower, were with him at the time of the death. We also believe that Mrs. Cox's husband, uh, lawyer Edward Cox, was with them. We do not know about Julie Eisenhower's husband, David Eisenhower. From here, what happens next, we are not quite certain. Uh, although we are waiting to hear what President Clinton says in the announcement, but it is believed that after uh, some sort of uh, mortuary procedure here that the former president will be taken back uh, to New Jersey, which has been the state of his residence for some time. Jameis in the New York Hospital will go back there as things uh, develop. Remember that Pat Nixon, the president's wife, died only last June, and... The family has been here in New York, as Bob Jamison said. We believe they went up for dinner a while ago. But as we said, this has been uh, pretty much expected for much of the day. Um, not going to tell Americans anything most of you don't know at the moment. Some people loved and respected Richard Nixon. Some hated him. Uh, very few were indifferent. He was one of the most controversial American political figures of the century. As we said, his career began in controversy, and it never changed when we look back. He was a public figure on the American political stage for nearly half a century. Richard Nixon accomplished great goals in foreign policy. He was the only president to resign in disgrace from office. He was born in Yorba Linda, California in 1913, the son of Quaker parents. Having worked his way through college and law school, in 1940 he married Patricia Ryan. Two years later he went into the Navy. In 1946 the country was preoccupied with communism. Richard Nixon ran for Congress, 
he accused his Democratic opponent of being soft on communism. He won. Arriving in Washington, Nixon got a seat in the House on American Activities Committee, coming to national attention during the investigation of the State Department official Alger Hiss. In penetrating to the bedrock of the facts relevant to the charge which you have publicized. In 1950, he ran for the Senate, and this time he accused his opponent Helen Gehagen Douglas of being soft on communism. She accused him of Nazi tactics, but he won. He was in the Senate at 37. Only two years later, the Republican leadership chose him to be Dwight Eisenhower's running mate in the presidential campaign. But soon reports surfaced of a secret fund given to Nixon by wealthy California contributors. Leading Republicans questioned his usefulness to the ticket. But in a dramatic television speech, Nixon took his case to the people. He denied taking money. He did say he had accepted one gift. You know what it was? It was a little cocker spaniel dog in a crate that he'd sent all the way from Texas. Black and white, spotted. And our little girl, Tricia, the six-year-old, named it Chex. And you know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. After the checker speech, he got a million telegrams of support, and it saved his place on the ticket. On January 1953, he and President Eisenhower were sworn in. Seven years later, having been one of the country's most visible vice presidents, he ran for the presidency against John F. Kennedy. In the first nationally televised presidential debate, Nixon appeared nervous and defensive. He blamed poor lighting and a bad makeup job, and he lost the election, though it was very close. Two years later, Nixon ran for governor of California and lost again. Just think how much you're going to be missing. You don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. Because, gentlemen, this is my last press conference. Not by any means. In 1968, Richard Nixon was back, and in 1969, he was president. Having lost a close one eight years ago and having won a close one this year, I can say this. Winning's a lot more fun. <laughs> it was a bad time for America. Vietnam, student demonstrations, and the defining trauma of the Nixon presidency, Watergate. An illegal break-in for political gain and a cover-up that went all the way to the top. After more than a year, Watergate brought him down. Including primarily the president that the whole story of the Watergate should be made public. While he continued to struggle at home, no one can deny Nixon's success abroad. An historic reopening of relations with China after almost 30 years. The beginning of a new and fruitful strategic arms reduction process with the Soviet Union. An end, finally, to the war in Vietnam. The brief history of one of America's most controversial politicians. And finally, the first president ever to resign from office. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. The next... Under threat of impeachment by the Congress, Richard Nixon resigned. He said goodbye to his White House staff in the East Room. Always give your best. Never get discouraged. Never be petty. Always remember, others may hate you. Those who hate you don't win, unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. You heard uh, me say in the middle of that, that was the short history of what we will forever call one of the most controversial politicians in the post-war period. There is so much uh, to be said about Richard Nixon, and all across the country tonight, I must tell you, through various electronic points, people are streaming in to reminisce about this man who... If you look at the China visit there, paid five visits to China and ten visits to the Soviet Union. One of the first people to join us this evening to talk about Richard Nixon's uh, political impact on the country, political and social impact as well, is Hal Bruno, who's ABC's political editor. Now he's in Washington uh, during Richard Nixon's presidency from 1969 to 74. Hal, you were the chief news editor for Newsweek in Washington. Richard Nixon didn't like you very much. Before you plunge straight into Watergate, uh, give us uh, give us your first thoughts uh, when he died. You knew it was coming. Sadness, Peter. Uh, Richard Nixon accomplished a lot in his political career. You mentioned some of them there in that piece. Uh, opening the door to China, 
uh, easing the tensions uh, with the Soviet Union, peace in Vietnam. He had a sophisticated knowledge of foreign policy. And here was the, the cold warrior who turned into a very masterful diplomat and brought a lot of good to the world. Uh, on the domestic front, uh, he was very successful as a president. And the tragedy of Richard Nixon is that most of all, he's going to be remembered from Watergate. I'd also like to correct one thing, Peter. A actually, when he began his comeback in 1966, I traveled with him and got to know him pretty well. And he liked me very much at that time, and I liked, respected, and admired him. It was only because of my involvement in the Watergate investigation. Uh, from that time on, I never was able to talk to him again. President Nixon himself, himself once said, Hal, of course, that he would always acknowledge that he would be known as the disgraced former president because of Watergate. Is your own guess that history is always going to have that label on it, or will somehow his impact on China and his contribution to ending the tension with the Soviet Union will overwhelm it at some point? I don't think it'll overwhelm it, Peter. I think all of those things will be mentioned. He will get the credit he deserves for the historic role he played. But always there is going to be the blot of Watergate, because there never has been anything like that in our political history. It was the massive abuse and misuse of presidential power, and uh, the result is he became the only American president who had to resign in office. Um, also joining us now, someone else who knew Richard Nixon well and interviewed him many times, Barbara Walters. Barbara, it is your program with uh, Louis Farrakhan that we uh, interrupted this evening. Talk a little about uh, the Richard Nixon you knew. Well, I covered him so many times um, when he was in the White House. He was an uncomfortable man. He wanted to reach out and be friendly, but he never could somehow make one-to-one -one relations. Had very few close friends, although he was beloved by his two daughters and uh, four grandchildren. He was able to have the intimacy with them. I feel, Peter, when I listen to Hal talk, that perhaps his finest time was really after Watergate. Most men would have given up. I don't know how they would have gone on. This man had a humiliation, a very serious illness, and yet behaved with respect and discretion, didn't seek the limelight, did, never went back to the White House, and through his writings and through his knowledge of foreign policy, won the respect of people who had really felt that he had disgraced the presidency. He had a new book mm -hmm. about the Kamat. As a matter of fact, we were going to do an interview with him in two weeks. Let me ask you this. Do you let, think... me say, let me just say one little huh. thing about the book. What I find very touching about the book, which has not yet come out, is that it is dedicated to Patricia Ryan Nixon, the Goodwill Ambassador. That's so much on his mind, that relationship with his wife, and we think of this now at his own death. Well, it is just about a year ago now. Do you think that in, in these final years he had come to terms with the legacy to which everybody will ascribe? He refused to look back. He never complained and he never explained. He did say in an interview that, that we had done that he was sorry that he hadn't burnt those tapes. But again and again he said, I'm going to go forward, I won't look back. Look, it was always there. But by his own intelligence, by traveling all over the world, you know, he was, as you know, Peter, he still was welcome wherever he went in the world. He'd just been to, to Russia recently. Uh, he went back and forth to China so many times. He continued to live his life as a man who respected himself, and I think most of us ended up feeling that way about him. We have a report, uh, we have a piece that Barbara prepared earlier about her reminiscence. We're going to come to that in a moment, but I think it's probably only fair, particularly for our younger viewers. Uh, the one's appraisal of Richard Nixon has a fair amount to do with not only, as Barbara said, where you lived in the world, um, because people in other lands just did not have that sense of impact that people in America did at the time of Watergate, but also how old you are because of so many Americans now um, who, didn't, uh, who weren't politically aware to say the least at that particular time. So here is a little bit of Watergate from our reporter, Jim Wooten. I, Richard Nixon, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I He'd heard the words before and the music too. His second inauguration, a capital moment in his long career, for by January 73, he'd crafted promising new ties to China and to the Soviet Union and the Vietnam War, that great gash in the American body politic, was at last winding down. 
Richard Nixon seems happy and hopeful. As we meet here today, we stand on the threshold of a new era of peace in the world. In fact, he stood on the threshold of disaster and disgrace. For by January 73, his presidency was also winding down. Its ending had its beginning the previous June at this office hotel residential complex called the Watergate, where several Republican operatives were caught inside the Democrats' headquarters. And by January 73, this man, James McCord, one of the seven men on trial for the break-in, was telling federal judge John Sirica that Mr. Nixon's aides had not only committed perjury during the trial, but that the White House had tried to buy the defendant's silence with cash and presidential pardons and good jobs when they'd served their time. I had no knowledge of the Watergate at all, no involvement in it. Almost overnight, Watergate became a synonym for scandal, as the burglary was revealed as merely the tip of a much broader conspiracy funded by the Nixon re-election committee designed to sabotage the Democrats and approved by this man, John Mitchell, the Attorney General of the United States. The question then was, was the President of the United States involved? I began by telling the President that there was a cancer growing on the presidency, and if the cancer was not removed, the President himself would be killed by it. John Dean, the young White House counsel in charge of a cover-up that was rapidly unraveling. And as it did, the casualties began to mount. H.R. Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, Mr. Nixon's right-hand men, fired, though defended, for their loyalty. I will not place the blame on subordinates, on people whose zeal exceeded their judgment, and who may have done wrong in a cause they deeply believe to be right. But at the Senate Watergate hearings, no one could find a hero. Though as a long list of crimes and dirty tricks began to emerge before the American public, Mr. Nixon himself emerged relatively unscathed. In all of the millions of words of testimony, there is not the slightest suggestion that I had any knowledge of the planning for the Watergate break-in. As for the cover-up, my statement has been challenged by only one of the 35 witnesses who appeared. Challenged by the man in charge of protecting him, John Dean. He'd made a deal with the government in return for his testimony that Mr. Nixon was indeed part of the cover-up. And challenged as well by this man, White House aide Alexander Butterfield who said Oval Office conversations were routinely recorded on taping devices. There was no doubt in my mind that they were installed to record things for posterity. Certainly not for the Watergate Committee, and Nixon refused to hand over the tape. This is a rather remarkable letter about the tapes. If you notice, the president says he's heard the tapes, or some of them, and they sustain his position. But he says he's not going to let anybody else hear them, or fear they might draw a different conclusion. <laughs> In October 73, fed up with the efforts of Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox to get his hands on the tape, the president fired it. Attorney General Elliot Richardson and much of the senior staff at the Justice Department resigned in protest. And the Saturday night massacre prompted Congress to consider Mr. Nixon's impeachment. He backed down, appointed a new prosecutor, handed over some of the tapes, and blamed it all on reporters. And yet, don't get the impression that you arouse my anger. <laughs> you see, I have that impression. You see, you, one can only be angry with those he respects. October ended with an 18-minute gap in one of the tapes. Just an accidental erasure, said his secretary, Rosemary Woods, who then demonstrated how it might have happened. Few believed her. The president struggled on, by then under fire for spending millions of government dollars on his estates and for paying almost no taxes as president. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. But in March 74, when seven of his top aides were indicted, he was named as their fellow criminal conspirator. In July 74, the Supreme Court ordered him to release the tape, and the House Judiciary Committee voted to impeach him. 
In early August, on one of the tapes, he was heard to ask the CIA to block the FBI's Watergate investigation. He was clearly part of the cover-up. That was the smoking gun. Four days later, on August 9th, after decades of seeking the White House, but only 2,000 days as president, he resigned with this emotional benediction to his staff. Always give your best. Never get discouraged. Never be petty. Always remember, others may hate you. But those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. And having done precisely that, he was gone. One of the preeminent politicians of post-war America, trapped in the tangled web of Watergate, he had helped to weave. Jim Wooten, ABC News, Washington. Jim Wooten now joins us from our Washington Bureau. Jim, just at the outset, tell me how much angst there was in that period, and tell those particularly who weren't old enough during that period. It was not an era that anyone living now or before would ever, could have, uh, would ever imagine could have happened in American politics or government. You had uh, days and weeks and months in which a president of the United States was under rather constant siege, both by the Congress and in the press, for criminal wrongdoings. It was... Uh, it was an era what I would not like to see repeated, and I expect that uh, most members of the press feel the same way. You hear often from President Nixon in retirement, and you certainly hear from many of his supporters that the press was out to get him, uh, unquestionably. Is that the way the Washington Press Corps felt in those days? I'm, I couldn't speak for the rest of the Washington Press Corps. I would say that Mr. Nixon was probably always his own worst enemy when it came to dealings with the press. Uh, I think he believed for many, many years before he ever uh, became president that most reporters were not interested in, uh, in any success in his career. He accepted that as a given. He regarded them always not simply as adversaries in the general give and take between politician and media, but as real enemies and foes. That affected his dealings with them, and I expect that affected the way they dealt with them. A number of people have said to me in the last couple of days when, of course, everybody knew this was coming, that Richard Nixon's behavior and his relationship with the press has changed the way the presidency will be treated in this country by the press forever. What do you think? Well, I expect that after, uh, after the era of Woodward and Bernstein and the era of Watergate and the actual resignation of a presidency as a consequence of, uh, of what began simply as newspaper investigation, I expect that uh, presidents are treated differently now. Uh, I expect that most members of the press uh, don't regard the presidency as quite as sacred or as holy as, it, as they might have before. Thank you, Jim, very much. Jim Wooten, our political reporter in Washington. A number of people have made the point that President Roosevelt, President Kennedy, President Eisenhower, President Truman uh, had conferred on them just by being in the presidency a kind of nobility and that with Richard Nixon that all disappeared. And some people will argue, of course, that the kind of treatment Bill Clinton gets today from the press uh, has something to do with the relationship that Richard Nixon had with the media uh, during his final days in office. We're joined by another reporter now who's seen a lot of Mr. Nixon uh, in his retirement period, Michael Kramer, the political writer from Time magazine. Michael, you went out to New Jersey often and you sat down with him. Did he come to terms, do you think, with his legacy? I don't know if he came to terms with it, but he certainly tried to massage it. Uh, Jim spoke about how he always felt that those of us uh, journalists were his enemies. Uh, afterwards, after he resigned, I think he tried to co-opt us, make us allies, make us tools of his rehabilitation. And he was very assiduous at doing it. How did he do it? Uh, and very successful. I think he did it basically by force of intellect. Uh, whatever you can say about the man, he certainly had uh, quite a brain. And freed from the responsibility of election or re-election, he turned everything uh, toward uh, rehabilitating himself in the area of foreign policy, which was his, uh, mm. his suit. And uh, it was really quite remarkable. It, it, it is sometimes said that his intellect in foreign policy in these latter years has been somewhat overrated. Now, you write about foreign policy as well as domestic. Make a judgment about that, if you would, and then add what you think his 
his most considerable foreign policy legacy will be? Well, I think that uh, those who would say it's overrated have to uh, have to answer the question compared with what. Good point. Um, with the possible exception of his confederate, uh, Henry Kissinger, I don't think it's uh, possible to uh, compare him with anyone else. And even Kissinger, I think, uh, in some of his uh, uh, quieter moments, uh, gives a lot of the credit for the promulgation of foreign policy during Nixon's presidency to the president himself. Um, I think in recent times, one of the most interesting things that Nixon has done, and he did it uh, during the 1992 campaign, has caused both President Bush and then Governor Clinton to get on the bandwagon to support reform in Russia. And I think it was a real question at that point uh, whether or not either of them uh, would do that. I think he propelled that debate. He gave it an intellectual underpinning, and uh, it's where we are today. Now, you can argue with a policy. You can say that we've gone too far. But I think it has its genesis with the clarity of thought that he brought to how to treat Russia in the post-Soviet period. Michael, just stay with us for a second, just so I remind people exactly what has happened. President Nixon, 37th president, died at 9.08 here at New York Hospital. He had a... Oh, you need... Went into a deep coma last night. It was literally only a matter of time. We knew pretty much this afternoon that he might not last throughout the evening. His family, his two daughters, and their husbands have been up here in New York uh, through the day. Uh, the president, as you may have heard over the last couple of days, had, had participated in what's sometimes called a living will, which was that he decided for himself uh, before uh, he became extremely ill that he didn't want any extraordinary measures used to try to keep him alive. Beyond that, we're not altogether sure what the family has decided, though they do not want, we're told, a, a state funeral in Washington, that he will be buried in California, uh, where Mrs. Nixon, his beloved wife, who died a year ago, was buried. And beyond that, um, we simply do not know. But we are waiting for President Clinton to come and make a statement in the White House in about uh, a minute and a half from now. We are joined uh, also, as I said, people were coming in from around the country here in New York by Tom Wicker, former uh, reporter, political reporter, former columnist for the New York Times, who wrote a very well-known book about Richard Nixon called One of Us. Tom, you may have only, I'm over here a bit, if you can look a little to your right. Oh, there we are, thank you. Um, we, uh, we have only about a minute and a half at the moment, but you've written so extensively about Give us a first impression of how you remember him. Well, I think Mr. Nixon was um, one of the most informed and um, thoughtful presidents that we've had. He was uh, known for secluding himself in, uh, in a room and uh, putting together his own speeches, maybe not the final text, but the, the general outline of it. And I think most presidents have not been that, uh, that uh, interdirected. You told me the other day why you had given your book about the president the title One of Us. I'm not sure we can squeeze it in in a minute, but try. Well, because I thought that he shared uh, many of the qualities that uh, most of the American people do. They don't perhaps, perhaps like to admit it, but he had, said, he had said himself that you have to understand the dark side of the American people in order to deal with them, something to that effect, and I think that was true. This is a president about whom almost immediately upon his death, people are talking about the dark side as well as the upside. Well, it was very visible. I was thinking a little about the, uh, the appellation, the nickname Tricky Dick. Where did he get that? He got that in the 1950 campaign against Helen Gahagan Douglas. He called her enduring revenge for being defeated by Richard Nixon that she pinned that nickname on him. This was the very first Richard Nixon, the anti-communist, in America's preoccupation with the Cold War right after the war. He wrote anti-communism through the Helen Gahagan Douglas campaign and through many others, didn't he? Uh, yes, and through the uh, exposure, if that's what it was, of Alger Hiss. That was what brought him first to the attention of the American public. What was it about him that impressed you in this regard? Um, he was an anti-communist who went to China. He ended 23 years of American isolation of China. He was an anti-communist who started the process of detente and nuclear arms reduction. What was it about him that made him make that corner? Well, he was a very contradictive character. He, he was generally regarded as a Republican conservative, but he was not a doctrinaire conservative. He had a horror, for example, of unemployment. He uh, imposed wage and price controls for the first time in peacetime that any president had ever done. Nixon was, uh, was a strange and contradictory character in that way, uh, but uh, in particular, he was interested in foreign affairs and uh, devoted himself to that. Mm -hmm. Tom, hang on with us for a second, as I've asked everybody else to do. Barbara Walters, uh, we cannot help but talk about Richard Nixon without talking about Henry Kissinger. Barbara Walters talked to Kissinger just yesterday about the Nixon legacy. Barbara, why don't you introduce this for us? 
Well, of course, Henry Kissinger served as the uh, Chief of National Security for Richard Nixon and then as his Secretary of State. He was with them throughout Watergate and into Gerald Ford's presidency. And the two men together formulated uh, the foreign policy. Um, and they were an odd relationship as two men. And Henry Kissinger remembers those times. Dr. Kissinger, what do you consider Richard Nixon's greatest foreign policy achievement? I think his most significant achievement was conceptual, that he tried to take the various elements of American foreign policy and relate them to a central theme and make them operate so that they were mutually supporting each other. Out of this then grew the opening to China, the Middle East peace process, the relaxation of tensions with the Soviet Union, the end of the war in Vietnam, and what he used to call a structure of peace, which now people would call a new world order, that he wanted to build in his second term. What do you think was his greatest disappointment or failure in foreign policy? Uh, his greatest disappointment was obviously that what had been so carefully set up in the first term could not be brought to fruition in the second term. Uh, maybe, I don't really think there was a failure, anything you could describe as a failure in, in his foreign policy. Perhaps he was a little too intellectual in his approach. Perhaps he thought but he did not understand, as for example Ronald Reagan did, that you have to appeal to the emotions of the American people and not only to the intellect. You knew Richard Nixon very well and worked with him very closely. He was such a contradictory man. Describe him for us as best you can in personal terms. How did you feel about him? We were a strange combination because he recruited me from the staff of his major opponent in the Republican Party, Nelson Rockefeller. Our backgrounds could not have been more different. He from California, I am a, refu I, a refugee uh, from Europe. We had very little social contact. Uh, but that didn't mean very much because uh, Nixon didn't have much social contact with anybody except one or two personal friends. He fulfilled himself mostly in working. Strangely enough for a politician, he was extremely shy. He hated to meet, at least until later in life, new people outside of a work context. Part of Barbara Walter's interview with Henry Kissinger, uh, who said they had a strange relationship, indeed they did, uh, in both Kissinger's memoirs and President Nixon's memoirs, they are both flattering and critical of each other. But we've interrupted because President Clinton has now showed up at the White House and clearly wants to talk to the nation on this occasion. He's going to do so in the Rose Garden, which of course reminds us that Tricia, President Nixon's daughter, who's now 48 years old and married to Edward Cox, was married in the Rose Garden. And uh, the fact that Tricia is now 48 and her sister Julie is 45 will remind many in our audience of the passage of time. But uh, President Clinton wishes to speak to the nation. It is my sad duty to report to the people of the United States that Richard M. Nixon, who served as our 37th president, died this evening in New York City at 9.08 p.m. with his family at his side. Hillary and I send our deepest condolences to the entire Nixon family. We hope that Tricia and Edward Cox and their son Christopher and Julie and David Eisenhower and their children, Jenny, Alex, and Melanie, know that the best wishes of all their fellow Americans are with them during their moment of sorrow. It's impossible to be in this job without feeling a special bond with the people who have gone before. And I was deeply grateful to President Nixon for his wise counsel on so many occasions on many issues over the last year. His service to me and to our country during this period was like 
the rest of his service to the nation for nearly half century. He gave of himself with intelligence and devotion to duty. And his country owes him a debt of gratitude for that service. We face today a world of increasing uncertainty and difficult challenges, but it is a world of great opportunity, and no small part because of the vision of Richard Nixon during a particularly difficult period of the Cold War. He understood the threat of communism, but he also had the wisdom to know when it was time to reach out to the Soviet Union and to China. All Americans, indeed all people throughout the world, owe him what he regarded as the ultimate compliment. He was a statesman who sought to build a lasting structure of peace. To be sure, he experienced his fair share of adversity and controversy, but his resilience and his diligent desire to give something back to this country and to the world provide a lesson for all of us about maintaining our faith in the future. In spite of everything, that faith led President Nixon to leave his mark on his times as few national histories of two na few national figures have done in our history, and led him to continue to serve right up to the end of his life. Indeed, no less than a month before his passing, he was still in touch with me about the great issues of this day. Again, I say the the sorrow and the best wishes of the American people are with President Nixon's family. We thank them and our prayers are with them. Have thank you. Have spoken to the family, Mr. President? I have. I spoke with uh, both Tricia Cox and Julie Eisenhower this evening, and we had a very good visit. Well, are you going to the funeral? Excuse me? Are you going to go to the funeral? I intend to go, yes. Uh, the family has not made announcements, uh, and I, I'm not sure they've made final decisions. It's my understanding that the funeral will be in California, and they'll announce uh, something about it to probably tomorrow. Will all the presidents be going, former presidents? I can't say that. Can you tell us something about your relationship with Mr. Nixon? Yes, well, uh, we made contact with each other uh, shortly after... Uh, I think shortly after the election, either that or shortly after I came in here. And then, as you will remember, I, I had him up to the White House for a visit. Uh, we talked uh, frequently on the phone. Uh, I sought his advice about a number of issues uh, in foreign policy, and we talked uh, quite a lot about Russia. We had a good long visit uh, right before he went to Russia. And as I said, uh, just a month ago, uh, today, I think, he penned his last uh, letter to me of uh, his thoughts on that trip and his advice. And so uh, our relationship continued uh, to be uh, warm and constructive throughout the period of my presidency, and he went out of his way to, uh, to give me uh, his best advice. And I was incredibly impressed with the energy and the vigor and, frankly, the rigor that he brought to analyzing this issue. And thank you very much. President Clinton commenting really on three aspects of the Nixon presidency there. One, clearly the rehabilitation of, of the former president when uh, Mr. Nixon says he provided wise counsel to me. The first person to invite President Nixon back to the White House was President Reagan when he invited him back at the time of the Sadat assassination and he then sent uh, President Carter and President Nixon uh, together to Anwar Sadat's funeral in Egypt. And then there is President Clinton talking about the special bond that any president feels with those who have gone before it. To remind us that the last time a former president died was in 1973, and that was Lyndon Johnson, and of course Richard Nixon was president at the time. And of course he speaks about his resilience, and virtually everybody who has talked about Richard Nixon, both the upside and the downside, the bright side and the dark side, the controversial side, the political side of this former president who has been such a dominant figure in American politics for so long, uh, always speaks of his resilience. There is a famous quote from Richard Nixon who says, I've never been a quitter to leave office before my term is completed as opposed to every bone or instinct in my body. This, as you can imagine, is at the time of Watergate. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow, August the 8th, 1974, one day before he left the White House and went into exile, which was not by any means to be permanent. 37th President of the United States, 
dying in New York at 81. We're going to leave now so you can join your local news and other programming around the country. Not long from now, there will be a special edition of Nightline. I hope you'll join ABC News then. I'm Peter Jennings in New York. Mm -hmm.